Well, hey, everybody, we'll go ahead and get started. If it's okay, if everything's working all right here. <clears throat> Can y'all hear me okay? <clears throat> Ooh, pecan, pe peanuts, cotton, chicken farmers. Mm. And that stuff you never hear in the news, do you? When that kind of thing happens. Mm. Oh, I better turn this thing off right here. I got a little thing that notifies me of news stories. If I don't, if I don't turn it off, it'll pop up the whole time on the recording. <laughs> Here we go. <clears throat> Paul Allen, the founder of Microsoft, just died. <clears throat> yeah, Mariana really got nailed too. <clears throat> Who is that, Carol? That must be you. We hear you pretty well. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you now. Yay, 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 yay. Good, good. Good deal. <clears throat> well, let's pray together. We'll go ahead and get started in this and see what we learned this week on one of our favorite subjects, I'm sure. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, Father, as always, we do give you thanks <clears throat> uh, for the word you've given us, for the instructions, the commandments the life, Lord, that you've given us, the life within and the life of your word. We thank you for that. Uh, Lord, we do particularly uh, pray for and intercede for those that have been so grievously affected by uh, not only this storm here, but tsunamis on the other side of the world and storms all around. Um, Lord, we know that your word tells us about these things and that trying and troubling and difficult times will come. And Lord, I guess, uh, speak your provision upon each one. Lord, your peace upon each one. Those within our home counties, Lord, who've lost crops, who've lost uh, lifetimes of uh, possessions. Um, Lord, just protect them. Watch over them. And I pray, Lord, that you would just uh, restore everything. Lord, that you would do uh, for all of them what you did for Job. Lord, that you, where you restored devil. Uh, just provide for them. Watch over them. Now, Lord, just show us your truth now. And we thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Whew. <clears throat> Good deal. Uh, I'm, I may have to step out here in just a moment because I still have Camp with me. Say hi, Camp. Hello. Oh, being goofy. Hello. He's a goofy Camp today. Hold on, hold on, hold on. So, so anyway, y'all still there? Uh Okay, good. My little uh, dialogue thing here is dragging a little behind, I think. <clears throat> Whew, so, where are we? We're in Lesson 6 of James, Chapter 3. Uh, if someone came up to you and said, What is Chapter 3 of James about? What would you say? <laughs> Carol says, A mouth and the tongue. Lynn says your tongue. Ah, <clears throat> oh, yeah. Lynn says how uh, how the tongue reflects the heart. Anything else? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it has some things here related to wisdom. Are wisdom and the tongue separate subject matter? The tameless tongue? <laughs> yeah, you chased around some things in the homework a good bit of, related to the, the gifts of the Spirit. So, tell me, what is the context of this? Because we know that there's no verse that gets this outside of context and stands alone. Uh, what have we seen so far? Just real quick, what's chapter 1 of James about? Oh, okay, so Kimberly's following up with another question. Uh, knowing uh, when not to speak or when to speak requires wisdom from God. Yeah, chapter 1 talks about trials and uh, uh, one's faith. And what else was chapter 1 about too? 
you have trials, you have joy. Remember that whole thing of uh, being a doer of the word and not hearer only? The doer of the truth that you prove to be doer? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you think that might have something to say in relationship to uh, the third chapter? So what was the second chapter about? So the first one is trials, be doers of the word. The second chapter is about what? Yeah, that whole thing that faith <clears throat> without works is dead. What else? Yeah, Carol, that's it. Not showing partiality. Uh, so let me just ask this little sidebar real quick. Are these lessons really striking anybody uh, other than me and Carol? <laughs> <laughs> What are you laughing over? <laughs> yeah. Well, see, Carol said amen because I, I I just know a little bit about some things happening in Carol's life. A what? Uh, a little bit. And uh, and does this not just uh, speak to, convict, uh, strengthen, encourage, Carol? I mean, I think it's very encouraging for us, though it's hard nonetheless. So, yeah, we, we saw that you're not to show any partiality, no favoritism between anybody. And that faith without well, works. Now, that's interesting, Lynn. Why is it kind of scary, too? Look, Lynn said kind of scary, too. Kind of scary, too? Yeah. What's scary? Uh, something that the Bible says. What it's saying here about the, in the third chapter about holding your tongue. You know how you and I were talking today and I got onto you because you kept mouthing off at me? And I told you you don't, you don't need to always say what you're thinking. That's a good lesson, isn't it, for a seven-year-old to learn? Well, Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> to me, it's scary because I look at what all James 1, 2, and 3 so far is talking about. And um, we're going to be held accountable for our tongue, whether we're doers, whether our faith is uh, strong, whether we are... Um, when we're going through trials, if we stay close to the faith, we're going to be judged by everything that that's related to all of these chapters. And it's just so scary because you look and see how many times you fail. Yeah. And it's like, oh, Lord, help, you know, because it's just scary because everything counts. And then when you start reading this about the, you said, where does James 3 start? It starts talking about, let not many of you become teachers. Yes, what is that all about? And yeah. they're going, I'm saying, oh, my word, I have spent my whole, my whole life, you know, doing so that. Do and you, you just sit and think, okay, what have I said along the way that may have led someone astray or they misinterpreted or I misinterpreted something? Mm -hmm. And it's just the, you know, the... The accountability that that is in all of this. So I don't know. That's that. It's kind of scary. So is our our, and I know you're not doing it from this perspective, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, is it hopeless? Oh no, I don't mean hopeless. Right. But, it's, but just that accountability for everything that I've taught, everything I've said. All you know, the people are looking at how I react to things. If I'm in a tough time and a trial. People are watching to see how I react to those things, or if you know, if somebody yeah, 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 do I yeah, yeah with them, or do I stand up and say, you know, I don't want to hear that. People are watching, and I'm held accountable. So I say it's pretty, yeah. I say like that. It's yes, it's serious. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, I think Jan it's is. It's not hopeless, but it's it's serious stuff. No, it is serious, and the bottom line with it is exactly what you're expressing, is that in the flesh and in of ourselves. We, we are we have no hope we can't do it <clears throat> we totally can't do it but what James is saying is that in the Lord we are empowered to do this we are empowered to walk in a way and it is it's very very convicting all the way through uh, remember that it's, it's uh, if there's hope <clears throat> the Lord is convicting if there's no hope and you feel beat down all this and the enemy's condemning you right <clears throat> So Rachel says, but we can't have condemnation. We just have to do our best. If we fail, repent. That's it. And you and you walk and you continue to learn. And James, the third chapter, is actually very encouraging about that. <clears throat> okay, Because well, what does it say at the very beginning? Lynn, you just mentioned it. You transition out of this thing that, you know, faith apart from works is dead. 
and uh, it's in the works that are evidence that your faith is being perfected, that's being completed. And then he just says, what? Remember, there's no chapter division, no verse division. Let not many of you become teachers. So why in the world is he saying that at that moment, at that time in his letter, in the way that it's flowing? Okay, God knows the tension of our heart. Is he talk? Who's he talking to about this? <laughs> yeah, that's that's the encouraging thing. We all stumble in many ways. <laughs> yeah, where was that? The second verse. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, that, that's interesting. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren. So he's speaking to the brethren. Remember who he's writing to? He's writing to the dispersed tribes. Well, why not let many of you become teachers? What does he say here? What's going to happen to Lynn? Yeah, she's going to have a stricter judgment. <laughs> and that's the thing you sit there and go, what, what is this all about? So, then you spent, what did you spend, a day, I think, of the homework? Uh, chasing that around a little bit. What did we learn about uh, teachers from the cross-references? Heaps of cross-references. Oops, okay, right. Yeah, there were quite a bit of cross-references. What did you learn about teachers? There's a couple of really important things about this. I want to make sure we see it. And the homework nearly brought it out. Nearly almost, but not quite, but it sort of did. <clears throat> okay, Kimmy said, I think it's a spiritual gift from God. <clears throat> there you go, Lynn. I think that's the synopsis of the whole thing. Some are given a spiritual gift of God to teach. Okay, it's, it's a spiritual empowerment by the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit desires when the Holy Spirit wants to do it. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it's me or not. Uh, sometimes you would like to think so because uh, it's... Hang on a second. Oh, thank you. Camp. Okay. Uh, anyway, I heard another voice in the room. <laughs> I'm sorry. You want it to be the, the Spirit, okay? You want it. Well, that's what you see. Carol, you see that there's a... What? Uh, I said I was doing something on settings, trying to fix my thing. Uh -huh. And I put something on, and then it, and then it says, says in real life It started talking said. to you? Oh, you hit Siri. Okay. No, I didn't hit Siri. Oh, yeah. I, what's going to happen? This kid knows more about an iPad than I do. Okay? So, look what it's, uh, Carol just said. It's a gift of teaching is for us, equipping others for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. And that's what we see is that there's a gift of teaching. But I love this. When you look at other verses, you see that all believers are to teach. Okay? Everyone who is a believer will teach in one way or another, okay? Uh, by example, by the deed, some by the spoken word. <clears throat> and so it's really important when you're looking through all these cross-references and these verses and everything, to sort of see what the context is. So several of the cross-references are what we refer to as the spiritual gift passages, right? Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, 1, uh, 1 Peter 4, and uh, Ephesians 4. But even in saying that, uh, I, I, I look at this a lot different than I did even maybe five or six years ago on some things, okay? And so if someone is given a spiritual gift of teaching, they should teach. Who Who is James addressing right here in his first verse? So James was no, so are we all in stricter judgment? Well, it's those, it says, let not many of you become teachers. And he says, my brethren then, but what if the Lord has given you a spiritual gift to teach? What should you do? The same thing for giving you a spiritual gift of administrations or hospitality. You teach. That's exactly it. So why does he say, like, let not many of you become teachers? 
if you're given that gift, are you supposed to sit back and say, oh, I don't want to use it because I want to incur a stricter judgment? <laughs> Lynn, we've probably heard that before with people that we've asked to volunteer to teach or something, right? No, if, if you're gifted with this, then you need to be do it, doing it. Then why this little qualifier right here? Why this word of warning? Because that is sort of a word of warning, right? I think it actually gives us insight into some things of what was going on among the body of Christ, particularly those that were coming out of Judaism into the faith and in believing. Well, you got this whole thing with teaching coming out of the mouth, speaking forth some stuff. More than likely, what was happening here is what we see over in uh, uh, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and a lot of Paul's writings, where people were desiring to be teachers. And, and didn't James refer something to it? Uh, people who want to know things, but they don't really know it. I know Paul definitely told Timothy about that, about false teachers, those who want to be teachers but they really don't know what they're talking about. Okay, So I think this is a word of warning because the, the teacher, the rabbi position was held in such esteem, okay, in such a high position, that people were wanting to be in the position and yet they weren't really called to do that. Oh, is she? Mm -hmm. Y'all hang on a second. I'll be right back. Did she, she text said, you? She said come out. Okay. <laughs> Yes, I was expecting my wife to text me to tell Camp to go out. No, she texted him. <laughs> Say bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hey, I'll be back in just a second. I got to unlock the door for you. Bye-bye. It's breaking out. You shot me. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Thank y'all so much. <clears throat> Let me catch up where you were. Uh, Lynn says this, uh, maybe because where the brethren are located, the believers had Christ and those around them need to hear him. Pre uh, and we're pressured to teach. There we go. And Jan says we had snow today. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, snowing through the Midwest already. Uh, there were people who were seeking to be teachers right here that more than likely were not equipped by God to do that. Yeah, I saw Missouri had some snow. That's crazy. And James was just telling him, you need to know something, that there's going to incur a stricter judgment. And notice that James included himself in the midst of that, that we will incur a stricter judgment. So going back to the cross-references about the teachers, what did you what, what did you learn about the teacher? Yeah, there's a spiritual gift of teaching, and you saw that uh, everybody teaches in some form or fashion. What else did you learn? Well, that is weird, Rachel. Still snowing down there. <clears throat> Teaching must be true to the Word of God. Absolutely. What else? Yeah, what is the purpose of teaching? What is it? The whole goal and the whole, uh, of particularly teaching of godliness, godly teaching, is, um, remember the verse that described it, uh, 1 Timothy somewhere, uh, love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. You equip the saints for the work of the service of the kingdom. Lynn said, uh, one who turns to one who's back from straight, you will save a soul, will cover a multitude of sins. Yeah, and that shows like an individual that may not have the quote-unquote spiritual gift of teaching, but they're bringing others and they're bringing them into right relationship or they're telling them, hey, you know, this is a sin. You don't need to be doing this. And they share the truth. When you're doing that, you're teaching. Now, that Ephesians 4 passage is interesting. 
Okay. Yeah, Rachel, that's, uh, Ephesians 4 tells us that we're going to be doing these things until you attain unity and faith and knowledge. What what things will be there until we attain to the unity and faith and knowledge? And it's really the fullness of Christ, I think is what it says in that passage also. What's it, What things are being done to equip the saints? By this time, you'll be able to teach us a passage out of Hebrews. Yeah, very convicting thing. <laughs> yeah, it's a goal of cause and growth. This is what causes growth, and the body builds itself up. <clears throat> and Rachel says a lot of preaching is either fluff and very shallow, uh, nothing to grab and cause sh change. <laughs> You're right. I tell you, this Ephesians 4 passage is really, really, really important. And I think it's foundational for what the body needs to return to. Okay, what we need to return to. Because what you see there is that you have gifted individuals. That you have gifted people. And there's actually five of them that are listed. The apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher. And we've talked a lot about this through the various courses and times together. But it's really important to see what's going on. <clears throat> uh, for the longest time, I taught and believed, and I understand where it's coming from. And still, you know, I understand what people are saying. That, you know, okay... Uh, and the precept people actually say this. They'll say, well, this is a passage about spiritual gifts. Uh, I, I don't think it really is per se like that. Okay? These are spiritually gifted individuals. Okay? They're, they're gifted individuals. And I think the Spirit releases His gifts in the way that He desires. And that it's not quite as cut and dry a lot of times as we think it is. We want to point to somebody and say, okay, this is the teacher. They have a spiritual gift of teaching. Okay. Well, what do you do about the apostle? Well, most of the church just blows the, the apostle gift off and say, okay, is there a spiritual gift of apostling? You know, if you're going to say there's a spiritual gift of shepherding and a spiritual gift of teaching and a spiritual gift of evangelizing, and we know from uh, 1 Corinthians there's a spiritual gift of prophesying. But the apostle and the prophet, we basically just reject within the Western church today. You know, there's some real problems with that. And so I think these are spiritually gifted individuals that the Holy Spirit is releasing his gifts however he wants to. We want to be able to list it and say, okay, you're 30% this, you're 25% that, you're 25% this, whatever, you know which is, I think, wasting our time <clears throat> with some things. But you see that these spiritually gifted people equip the saints for the work of the service of the kingdom of God and the building up of the saints and the equipping of the saints. And then we read the passage further along. I think it's past verse 16. But I don't remember. Uh, it says it causes the building up of the church. The church builds itself up. We sort of approach it like we're having to build the church up from the outside So Carol asked, uh, doesn't Hebrews say uh, that God replaced that, that God spoke in prophets in the past, but through his son now? Yeah, and we'll see that when we study Hebrews. We'll start that in uh, January. But no, it's not talking about that, uh, that the Lord spoke through his son now, but that doesn't negate what was spoken in the past, and it definitely doesn't negate uh, what the Spirit does, the spiritual gift of prophesying. There's a uh, a real distinction between the spiritual empowerment to prophesy and the role of the prophet in the Old Testament. Okay, And even in the way that they spoke and the Spirit moved upon them. So we'll see more about that, but it's not the same thing. <clears throat> no. So there is um, a functioning within the body of apostle, the prophet, evangelist, the shepherd, pastor, and teacher. And, uh, and then Ephesians also says, you know, this is to be done until we attain to the unity of faith and the fullness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, we can look at each other in the church and go, well, we haven't got there yet, you know. Maybe it's because we've sort of uh, uh, rejected some things right here. So we are called uh, to teach. Everybody is called to teach. So uh, Rachel say, is verse 1 talking about the spiritual gift of teaching? I don't think it's so much talking about the spiritual gift of teaching as much it is that those who are seeking to attain the status of teacher, okay, who are wanting to be teachers, that perhaps weren't empowered to do so. He's just warning them, you know, hey, don't let many of you become teacher because you're going to have a stricter judgment. 
captain and is not to uh, uh, quench and to quench those that are called to be teachers. That's not the purpose, okay? What he's saying is that there's people right here that are trying to attain some things that they're really not called to attain to. You know, he actually builds on the second verse. What does he say in verse 2? For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. So how have y'all done this week in bridling your body? And what is meant by that, right? You notice the examples that he gave all the way through here. He's saying, first of all, what? Everybody stumbles. In many ways. <laughs> okay? Well, see, that's it. The whole point is, what does a bridle do? Somebody knows horses. Tell me here. <laughs> uh, Lynn hermitized herself. Yeah, it's a small thing that controls a horse by placing something in their mouth and bringing pressure up on their mouth and their tongue, that whole thing. So the picture is what? If someone can control their tongue, then it will control and, and uh, bridle and direct the entire body as well. And, 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 you know, he just gets forthright about it. He says, we put the bits in the horse's mouth so that they obey us. We direct their entire body as well. So their entire body is directed by this bridle. Oh, you th yeah. <laughs> okay, let's get there. So Rachel says, well, this gets a little extreme. I can handle, uh, <coughs> you know, the bridle. But he gives three examples, right? The next one was verse 4. Look at the ships also. Though they are so great and are driven by strong winds and are still directed by a very small rudder, wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. Now, these are nearly uh, parable little thoughts, ideas right here. So he's talking about a big, gigantic ship. The same thing applies today, whether it's a water vessel, whether it's an airship. If you've flown in a plane, you've seen how the Arions and things like that can get so control that plane and cause it to move and do all this kind of stuff. He's saying it's what? A very small rudder that directs the ship, but directs the ship based upon what? The rudder causes it to be directed where the pilot wants it to go. So wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. This is where I started just going, oh. And so if somebody doesn't know you, or even if they do know you, what pilot is being reflected by what's happening with your tongue? Right? Exactly. What, what is the nature of the heart? Is it the heart of uh, man? Is it the heart of the world? Is it the heart of flesh? Is it uh, the heart of the Most High God? You know, what's directing that? And he's really driving his home. He says, so also the tongue is a small part of the body. It's just a very small part. Yeah, that's it. The self versus the spirit thing. Yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. To which we all would readily acquiesce to and say, yeah, that's true. That's true. That happens. Verse 5. Yep. Yeah. Uh, that little spark, that little flame can cause such a roaring thing. And we could leave it right there and feel okay. But as Rachel's pointing out, verse 6, And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell itself. Whew. What, what do you say to that? <laughs> Rachel said, it's a bit extreme. So, I'm sure she says that tongue-in-cheek, because if the Lord says it this way, well, why did God give us such a terrible part of the body 
Uh, and Carol says, words can destroy a life. Yeah, well, you guys to get into this. Are you going to speak blessings or are you going to speak curses? Did the Lord give us such a terrible part of the body? That's, that's interesting. I never thought of that that way. Would we be better just to cut it out and throw it away? That's it. Our hearts, our, our tongue is just reflective of the heart. God made you with a tongue. Some people would be better off if they didn't speak, but they would still have the same hard heart, and their actions would reflect that in other ways. From the moment that the heart of Eve and Adam were reflected, when the deceiver, the accuser, looked at Eve and said, Did God really say? When he draw when he well brought the word of God into question. And her response was, Yeah, he really said, and he also said we die if we touched it. Okay? We die if we touch it. She was adding words to the word of God. And so, yeah, Rachel, I think what's being spoken of right here is that he's showing what happens to the unredeemed tongue or the tongue that is not under the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, can we do the same thing? Can we set a fire by hell itself with our tongue? Can a true believer do that? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking so, and Lynn's even more convinced. If we're not abiding, we can definitely do it. Because we're just speaking from the flesh, or we're speaking from our own desires. And there's several examples you can think of that. Uh, probably the one, the one that's popped in my mind is when, uh, is it over Mark? When uh, Peter sits there and says, uh, uh, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, you know, Jesus says, Hey, man, flesh and blood haven't revealed this to you, but the Father has. And on this, I'm going to build my church. And then four verses later, he's looking at Peter and says, Get thee behind me, Satan. Uh, Carol's has some real live examples in her life. The tongue will be the initial thing that goes rogue. And boy, is it not tart? Is it not terse? That's what it says right here. The tongue is a fire. And we know that fire is can be used for good and used for evil. Okay. Fire is good when it's cold. Fire's good when you want something cooked. Okay? But what he's saying is the very world of iniquity. And it's among our memory. It'll defile the entire body if we allow it to. Okay? If we allow it to. And it really is. That'll be the first thing that fires off. And it sets a fire and it sets a course. Notice that. It sets on fire the course of our life. And that doesn't sound like a good thing to me. Okay? It sets on fire the course of our life. So what example does he give us here in verse 7? Yeah, he's talking about species being tamed. So uh, Rachel says, but we could flip it to pause our tongues can positively affect our body and mind with the word. Absolutely. I think that our tongues have more power than we're even willing uh, to imagine. Okay? That we're even willing to imagine. I think the Lord empowers us through His Spirit to speak forth that which is not. Does He not say that somewhere in the Bible? You know, that idea of speaking. Uh, I'll give you an example of it. Uh, uh, within the arena of healing nowhere that I can find in scripture yet I sort of look for it when I read through the various passages I don't see where Jesus and the disciples prayed to the Father to heal anybody all it says was and they healed them and they healed them and they spoke things like be healed in the name of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ be healed there's power in the spoken word I think it's very much so, Rachel, of reading the scripture out loud. I recommended that to a young man today who's actually in the uh, National Guard unit. 
and he's wanting to do something on their uh, monthly little weekends together. And I told him, I said, you just need to get these guys together and just read the Word of God. Don't uh, say anything about it. Uh, don't open it up and say, what do y'all think about this? What do y'all think about that? Just read it. Just read the Word of God. For some reason, I told him to start with First John. I don't know why I said that, but that's, that's probably a good one. <laughs> so anyway, there's power in that. So Jan says, we didn't have a tongue. We wouldn't be able to praise God. I think that's part of the thing. Uh, is that God created to be used to his glory and his praise and man has perverted it uh, and yeah in the seventh verse he says that man has and the translation is tamed uh, really a, probably a better translation is subdued okay subdued uh, in other words man is able to subdue just about every creature it has been tamed by the human race verse 8 but no one can tame the tongue it's a restless evil full of of deadly poison if we can't tame the tongue then what do we do as believers oh it is let me back up here Rachel said I missed something oh yeah we are the only creature God created that speaks a speaking spirit very much so and that can communicate uh, and plumb the depths of God himself So, if we can't tame the tongue, if it's a restless evil and full of deadly poison, uh, what's the point? Where's the hope? What do y'all say? If you can't tame the tongue, we spend a lot of time in prayer asking for forgiveness. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he starts to give us some insight into it because we actually have points of decision in the flesh we cannot tame the restless evil of the tongue we cannot we don't have the antidote in the flesh okay of the deadly poison uh, I think it's very much so back in Genesis Rachel while mankind uh, was becoming more and more powerful remember what God said about that when they had one language he said there is nothing that they will not be able to do Right before he confused the language, God came down and said, let us go down there and see what they're up to. And that's a whole interesting thought, is it not? The whole us thing and then the need to go down and check it out. Couldn't he see from wherever he was? Of course he could. So he goes down, he does that, and then he says, you know, if they continue on this path, there's nothing they will not be able to do. And let me tell you, folks, there that is profound. There's some serious, serious things involved with that that we really haven't even addressed yet in all of our years together uh, related to what that is saying and what that is inferring and what it has to say to us. And it does speak to the power of the believer and the power in the tongue. And so he gives us an example of, in verse 9. He says, with it, with the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, which we're supposed to do, but then we curse men who've been made in the likeness of God. So why does he describe man as being made in the likeness of God? We know from over in Genesis that we were made to be what? Made in the image of God. And uh, Michael Heiser's got some great stuff related to that. How that God created us to be imagers of God. And that's so much more than the made in the likeness. Oh, I look like God or we look like him or uh, God is a spirit and we have spirit. Other animals will have bodies and soul, but we have body, soul, and spirit. It goes far beyond that. We are made to literally image God. Okay, be imagers of God. And there's so much with that. Yeah, Lena, I think that's what it is. When we are sitting there cursing men, we are cursing one that God has made. And that he's made in his image. And who knows what the Lord wants to do to that individual. And yet we're sitting there blessing the Lord. And then in the next breath we're cursing man. And he said this from the, uh, verse 10. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren. Notice how James keeps throwing out that. My brethren repeatedly uh, communicate love. Communicate the compassion he had. That we're all in the same boat together here. And also the fact that, they, that, that they're believers. 
my brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Uh, boy, let me just ask Lynn, because I know. Have you ever felt like just saying that in a committee meeting or a church business meeting? You know, my brethren, these things just should not be this way. You know, we shouldn't be acting this way. We shouldn't be saying this, you know. And he says, does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? In other words, can you have fresh and bitter from the same stream? Uh, well, the ungiven answer that's implied there is no. Verse 12, can a fig tree, my brethren, there's my brethren again, produce olives or a vine produce figs, nor can salt water produce fresh? He says, no, this can't happen. He said, we don't need to be speaking this way. So, what's, how does James bring this to a conclusion? How we should be uh, handling the tongue? What does he say? <clears throat> Go get wisdom. <laughs> I like that. Wisdom and understanding. He asks him, and, and he does this with him. Let me check. I think he does this at the beginning of, uh, well, I don't know how to say it. It's not so much a question. Uh, when he starts talking about something, sometimes he'll ask a question about it. And he'll make a statement. So he asks a question here. Who among you is wise and understanding? He says, if you have insight into this, if you have wisdom and understanding, then you need to know something. Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. And it's that whole thing that uh, very much echoes what you see in, in the first proverb, right? The early proverbs of going in uh, where wisdom is personified, to go and seek her, to look after her, to chase after wisdom. And he says, if you say this, then let your good behavior show it in gentleness of wisdom. So you're going to have wisdom, not harsh wisdom, but gentle wisdom. Verse 14 tells us what? If you have bitter jealousy... And selfish ambition in your heart do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth so he's coming out of this thing and everything we've learned about the tongue that is a you know a, a small part of the body is uh, you need to bless the Lord if you don't use the tongue to bless the Lord and curse man that no one can tame it that is evil and that it defiles the entire body all these things the fire of iniquity he says, but if you have this, what should you do? And Carol said, boy, did I want to throw someone in that. Uh, that's where the gentleness of wisdom comes in. So uh, you ask for wisdom and you didn't. Are you saying that you didn't do it because of the wisdom the Lord told you not to do that? Or you just calm down? Oh, yeah. The, the truth, the one truth in that. He says, if you don't have this, if you have bitter jealousy, if you have selfish ambition in your heart, he says, don't be arrogant and so lie against the truth. In other words, you need to know what the truth is and you're just deceiving yourself. And you think that you're walking in wisdom, but this is not wisdom. This is the wisdom of man. So Carol says, I didn't think the Lord would want me to say it because my heart wasn't really in the right place. So, well, let me just ask you point blank. Uh, was there bitterness? Was there anger? Here it says bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. Sometimes that sneaks up on us through the back door. We don't think we have that. But sometimes that selfish ambition is you just want to, and you can't be. You could be right biblically in what you're saying, but you're wanting everybody to know that you were the one right about it. Yeah, and so it's good to sit there and say, well, God, yeah, my heart's not right in this situation. What's happening? So verse 15, he talks about this wisdom. And the wisdom he's talking about is this bitter jealousy and selfish ambition and that kind of thing, where it's lying against the truth. And what do we learn about that kind of wisdom? What does it say in verse 15? Talk about some powerful words here, Rachel. Yeah. This wisdom, we'll start with, is not that which comes down from above. 
And there's some verses that speak of that type of thing, that the wisdom that comes from the Lord from above. And so you have this juxtaposition between wisdom from above and earthly wisdom. Because that, there is a wisdom of the earth. There is the wisdom of man. There's a wisdom of the... Uh, oh, I like this. that The Greek word right there is sukitos. Sukitos, which means natural. Or of the soul or mind. So, there's a comparison here. There's the juxtaposition between the wisdom of the spirit that comes from above and the wisdom of the soul. Okay? Or the wisdom of the mind. Yeah, the idea being that you've rationalized this, you worked it out in your mind, this makes total sense in your mind. If anything, the things that we do with our mind will make, quote unquote, more sense in what we see than that which comes from the Spirit. Does it not? So he says, but this kind of wisdom is it's earthly. <laughs> That's the temptation everybody has, yeah. So you say it's earthly, you say it's natural. You say, well, okay, well, we live on the earth. Well, we have a soul. We, we have a mind. God's granted us a soul. It's a mind. But then he drops this word. Let me see what the Greek is. Daemoniotis. Demon-like. Demon-like. Well, that's intriguing, isn't it? So you go from this thing that we nearly could handle earthly, natural, you know, to demonic. What does he mean by that? Ooh, I just thought of something related to that. This, this might be good. Uh, is that to, to the defiled? Is that what you said, Lynn? Lynn's sort of speaking in tongues a little bit here. <laughs> oh, of the devil, okay. <laughs> I guessed wrong, sorry. What, okay, look at this. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, so it's not coming from above. If it's not from above, then it's from somewhere else. One or two places. It's either going to be of ourselves, or it's going to be from below. Right. But it's earthly, natural, demonic. Demon-like. Uh, what does it mean to be demon-like? Is it our natural, sinful self? No, I don't, I don't think so. What's a demon? Ah, allowing Satan to rule. That, that's a good way to put it. A siding on the side of Satan. Okay. The disruption of the evil one somehow. Uh, there's actually debate. I used to be pretty... Uh, uh, forthright and what I thought where I thought the demons came from and I'm not quite as sure now I do know this that demons side on the side of Satan okay uh, they may be the uh, angels that rebelled against God you know when Lucifer decided what you see in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 that kind of thing uh, that could very well be it uh, they may have arisen from another thing that Satan did Okay, which we won't get into right now. Uh, I'm not quite as sure. I'll go with the rebellious angels right now, okay? What do those angels that rebelled against God with Lucifer in heaven do? Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, the enemy is the ruler of this world for this period of time, and he has his minions doing his work. Sure. But what did they do originally? They thought that they were wiser. Remember what Lucifer did? He said, I will ascend to the mount. I will do this. I will do that. You will worship me. That's it. And verse 16 gives us insight into it. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. James is tying this wisdom of man, this wisdom of the earthly and natural, that is, he's saying it's the same thing that the rebellious angels did. And they were motivated by jealousy, which came from Lucifer, uh, selfish ambition. And out of that came disorder and every evil thing. It's the same thing. 
So he's saying this wisdom, it comes from below. Okay, It's not good. We do not need to be living in it. But then a very encouraging but. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that connection either, but it's 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 pretty strong right there, I think. Uh, I could be totally wrong on that too. I didn't read that anywhere or anything, so if I'm wrong, I'll come back and tell you. But, um, you know, I've learned long ago, God hasn't revealed everything through commentaries, right? <laughs> <coughs> uh, but I think there is a thing right there, at least a parallel about what happened. Then verse 17, but the wisdom from above, so you see the juxtaposition he had, okay? Verse 15, this wisdom is not that which came from above, so it's the one from below, for lack of a better term. The wisdom from above is what? In, in English, this often sort of throws us off when it says from above is first. When I see that phrase first, I'm thinking what? Well, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. That's exactly it. It reminds you of the fruit of the Spirit uh, that you want to sit there and go, well, this is the most important, this is the next, and that's not what's written. Uh, it, that word at first actually means like chiefly. It's primarily pure. So wisdom from above is pure. Okay, and out of that purity is going to arise what? The fact that it's peace, peaceable. It really does. It relaxes you. It chills you out. Yeah, that's it, Jan. You ask God. It's pure. It's peaceable. It's gentle. It's reasonable. Full of mercy. Not just merciful. Not just has some mercy. It is full of mercy. And it's also full of good fruits. It's unwavering without hypocrisy. The wisdom from above has absolutely no hypocrisy. Whatever. The wisdom from below, below bitter jealousy, selfish ambition, arrogant boast. So what can we glean from that, Carol? If we see somebody who is functioning with... Uh, uh, lies and false against falseness against truth and selfish ambition bitter jealousy with earthly wisdom and natural type of insight we can know what that's not the wisdom we need to follow yeah that they're under something else but the wisdom from above and this is a great list okay because when you actually see it i think the lord reveals it sure yeah i think the lord will reveal it that is pure. Chiefly, it is pure. And that pure, uh, you know, in your homework it said, if you didn't know what some of these words meant, look them up if you had time. That kind of thing. It literally means without blemish. Without any type of defect, moral defect, okay? And the, the peaceful is free from uh, uh, anxiety, free from anything that's disruptive within your life. Uh, in general, is forbearing. We're told throughout the scripture to be forbearing with one another. Uh, merciful, showing mercy, good fruits. And so unwavering is the idea that's picked up in that second chapter there. Without favoritism that you're pressing in. Okay, you're pressing on. And without hypocrisy, it's without pretense. And it's really a picture of righteousness and peace throughout. So the, the wisdom of God is actually, and we saw this over in, was it 1 Corinthians? Is uh, uh, really the opposite of the world's wisdom. Okay? It's not at all what the wisdom of the world brings about. So what did we see in the first chapter of James? If you lack wisdom, you ask God. And in that context there was trials. And you remember in James, he told us to be slow to speak, slow to anger. Here he's telling us to do what? In the first chapter. Uh, you know, to bridle that tongue. Don't deceive yourself in any way is what he said in the first chapter. Acquire the wisdom of the Lord and realize that uh, we can do something. We can speak blessings or we can speak cursing. And we do a lot better if we just seek the wisdom of the Spirit and let Him speak to us. If you can't, ask God for wisdom. If you don't know what to say and you're burning and you think you're about to open your mouth and you're about to explode, bridle the tongue and <laughs> shut it, Lynn says. <laughs> Because if you're feeling that way in the flesh when you're about to say something, 
then you're likely not going to manifest a pure wisdom that is peaceful, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, with good fruits, unwavering, and without hypocrisy. This letter is very, very challenging. And it, it does... Yeah, it encourages change in a different way than Paul does. I can't quite put my finger on it. Uh, it may be uh, just the difference with um, a role and functioning of the composer. Well, that's it. James is very blunt, very practical, because he was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Okay? He was the leader of, of the people that were coming out of Judaism into uh, Paul was uh, on the road all the time, right? He, he had a different role, a different function. But it is. It's very practical. It's very down to earth. You know, I keep wondering what in the world was happening. What was happening that the Spirit was moving upon his life to speak these things? Well, there's a lot of it that we don't have to infer a lot. Obviously, there was bitter jealousy. Obviously, there were people rising up trying to be teachers. There were people that were sounding very wise. And everybody's going, ooh, ooh, ga ga. But their lives were not reflective of the true wisdom from above. Um, yeah, it was probably written pretty early. Okay? Probably written pretty early. Uh, so the last verse. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. What do y'all think that means? I hardly ever ask you that question that blunt like that. That last verse. I think there's little doubt that the Lord wrote this to, <laughs> to us. Well, there you go. I think that's a great one, Carol. Blessed are the peacemakers. Uh, it's just another picture of the tongue what seed are we going to sow with the tongue what wisdom are we going to sow the wisdom of man the wisdom of the soul of the mind or the wisdom of the most high God you know and then something else if we want righteousness to be the fruit in our life and in those around us then what must we do if we want there to be peace It has to be sown in peace. Oh, okay, Kimberly, it has to be living right, Lynn, my heart is right when I speak to others in teaching or in a rebuke. Yeah, that your heart is right, your heart's correct. You know, I think sometimes we think our heart has to be broken and all this kind of stuff. I, I don't think in the in the emotional, soulish kind of way. You can speak the truth. Okay? And it's speaking the truth in love. And yeah, Jan, there you go, that we literally must be uh, uh, the, the peace. We are the vessels that the Lord has chosen to release his wisdom from above in and through us in every situation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very, very uh, powerful, very convicting. Uh, if someone reads all this and says, you know, that's great, that's wonderful, uh, I, you know, I don't really feel convicted at all. Um, well, that's fine because the second verse says if someone doesn't stumble, he's a perfect man and able to bridle his whole body as well. He's complete. The idea of perfect, that you're complete in this situation. People say, well, it's not attainable because he says we all sin, we all stumble in many ways. Yes, we do, but it's not unattainable because we have everything that we need within us. We just need to uh, live within it, function within it, Abide in it, all the things y'all were speaking of earlier. <clears throat> Whew. So, uh, Carol, let me ask you. I know for me in my situation, this has been very convicting and very helpful all at the same time. How about you? <laughs> I've really been thinking of Carol all week long as we've been studying some of these things and looking at it and thinking, man, because uh, you're right in the midst of a situation that, uh, uh, that God knows all about. And that it's hard to live and, and, and manifest uh, things. But he empowers us. So anybody else have anything you want to share? I just looked down and saw what time it was. 
Oh, okay. Well, then, yeah, Lynn says, <laughs> or you get so misled and you're not really saved. You're just religious. We know in this situation right here, he kept driving home, my brethren, my brethren, my brethren. I'm going to take that, that he's speaking to those who are truly saved. If you're not truly saved, it's not going to matter how much you seek the wisdom from above until you have the transformed heart from above, right? That type of thing. Well, let me pray for us. Whew. <coughs> oh, I see what you mean, Lynn. If you read this and aren't convicted, you're not saved. <laughs> yeah. No, you're right. Yeah. Just that coldness. So, uh, Lord, you know our heart better than we do. And, Lord, you know our tongue. And so may we speak forth words of life. Lord, may we speak forth and manifest the wisdom from above to such a degree that people will actually be, an inqu will be inquiring and that we'll be able to say to them, no, 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 it's not us. It's not me in the flesh. It's not anything like this. It is literally the Most High God. It is the Most High God in His wisdom. And that people will be drawn to the kingdom because of that. Lord, we thank you, and we love you, and just bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much. See you next week.